and welcome to this latest edition of London Southeast. Here we go. Angus Energy is a story of success the hard way. CEO George Lucan inherited some disparate oil licenses in the wheeled, then transformed the company's fortunes by buying 51% of Salt Fleetby in Lincolnshire, which was once Britain's most productive onshore gas field. Over several, probably quite difficult years, George has raised the money to get Salt Fleetby into production. Now, here we are in September 2022, with Salt Fleet be putting gas into the national grid with consistent revenue streams, creating a base for growth. It's fantastic to have you here today, George. Uh, well done for getting to First Gas and Beyond. It must have been a mighty effort. It was indeed, and it's been a tremendous journey, for, for, for not only for us here at Angus, but all the shareholders who put up with the ups and downs of, of a very difficult onshore industry. And here we are chucking gas every day into the national grid uh, and enjoying tremendous uh, prices. Uh, a lot of this price, uh, a lot of this value is hedged for the next three years, a little over half, I think we've advised. But uh, even the other half that we intend to produce, it, it will be more than uh, worth the journey. I'm very glad you mentioned the investors there because we're, we're essentially doing an investor special today. We've uh, over 12 hours, here there's 12 hours only, we have collected 35 plus questions from investors and we're now going to put all those questions to you uh, uh, so that investors uh, get heard and get, the, and get their answers. Yeah. Uh, and I'd like to start by taking a moment to reflect that you're now a fully fledged onshore gas producer at a time of great need for domestic gas, which, to be fair, is a very useful place to find yourself. It is indeed. And I think the most important thing is to look at the bigger picture with Angus. Uh, we've acquired an asset uh, very cheaply. We, we, we financed the development of that asset. And we have a, a good competent person's report here it's indicating about 18 BCF. That's around 180 million therms uh, over the life of that field of which uh, less, than, less than a third are, are actually hedged. Uh, now you take the, uh, you take a 150 odd million therms, say uh, at today's prices, uh, when I say today's prices, the average for the next three, three years, Donald, you're looking at uh, you know, hundreds of millions of pounds, frankly, of, of value there to be one. This is a very different Angus uh, to the one that was scratching in the wheel basin frankly, three years ago. Um, uh, and uh, so it, whilst you know, our market cap may have risen astonishingly from six to 60 million, I don't even think it captures a fraction of, of the real value of this asset looked over the longer term. Did you really just say three years there, George? Is it only three years? Um, uh, what, the, 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 uh, the, the, the pricing estimate that I gave? No, no, the from, from the wheel to Salt Fleetby. Has yes. your interest in Salt Fleetby just been over the last three years? Yes, exactly. It's quite a transformation of a company from really uh, a difficult, increasingly difficult exploration in, in, in the southern half of England to fully fledged production here, here in Lincolnshire. Uh, and um, where, where, frankly, the, the planning environment it, it has been nicer to us. Uh, and in recent months, of course, the whole permitting environment uh, has got a little, little bit easier, too, as people recognise the need. And you're, you're right to focus on that. There's, there is a growing recognition uh, that we need this, this resource now for the next few years whilst we continue with the transition. So, okay. yeah. Now, we'll hold on to that thought and come back to, come back to the world later. But uh, focusing purely on current production, how much gas are the two operating wells producing? And is it what you were hoping for? It is absolutely what we're hoping for and more so. So deliverability from those wells has been... Uh, fantastic for the last two or three weeks. We've got no question whatsoever about that. Um, so could we produce uh, for, and certainly for a few months, uh, seven or eight million uh, scuffs from million standard cubic feet from those two wells? Yes, uh, without, without a precipitous drop in pressure. Uh, the, the, the uh, uh, what I'd say, the, the bottleneck, if there is one, is making sure we process that amount of gas. And that comes down to a complex interplay of compression and this dual Thompson valve uh, and actually, fun enough, what National Grid need in terms of pressure in their line. So you're, you're constantly balancing all of those three equations, the, the wellhead pressure, the actual process plant and what National Grid need. 
Uh, and that determines the amount you can flow. But am I satisfied, as I have I think we said in an RNS recently, that we can make uh, sort of 5.5 million uh, standard cubic feet a day, which more than comfortably covers our hedging requirement for the next quarter? Yes, yeah, without any doubt. Can we do better than that, is the question a lot of shareholders are asking me. And I say, well, just let us keep trying, because every day we're reducing uh, the amount of time we have to shut down, and every day we're increasing that throughput. So uh, I, I've said that we'll, we'll advise precise figures at the end of this month. We will. But it's good news. It's nothing but good news so far. And do, do so, you have a target that you're, you're aiming for, even though you may not necessarily want to share it with us? Do you have your own internal targets? I do. I do. Um, but we're, we're, but not, we're, not, we're not privy to them. We're not privy to that, no. We'll, we'll carry on pushing and pushing and pushing till, till we've, we've reached our, 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 well, my personal target at any rate. Great. And I'll take, take advice from there. Okay. And uh, a broad question on the next steps to take to make things work better. You've, you've already explained, in essence, what the, what the balancing act is. But, but, uh, three different investors want to know when the second compressor will be working, and Peter Butterworth is concerned that the current gas flows may be restricted by the lack of a second compressor. And Richard Sambrook asks, with two compressors in operation, how much gas would it be possible to produce per day and what level of profit might this give the company? OK, just give us a, you know, work your way around those, those thoughts. Uh, OK, right now, as I said, well deliverability is about 5 million standard cubic feet. The, the process plant is, is edging up toward 5. Um, uh, as we speak. If you're bringing on another compressor, you're clearly going to 10. Um, if you don't have the sidetrack done and you've got that second compressor on, then uh, as I've said, these wells as they stand can probably do seven. So you'd, you'd be making seven with a second compressor there uh, without the risk of a, of a sidetrack. But we, we've, we've always said we'd, we'd rather get that sidetrack in early and get, it, get the figure up to 10 uh, and then be processing with two compressors at least 10. Now, if the side track performs very well, we might do a little bit better than that. We're talking probably 10, 20% better if at, at our best. I would guess, um, you know, we, we, you can only push process plant so far. Uh, so that would, those would be the range. But there's a, you know, um, there is a degree of optionality. There's a degree of improvement we can get. Okay. Um, Alan Presnell, I hope I pronounced his name correctly, uh, uh, asks, uh, please, can you tell us how the stabilization is going at Salt Fleet B? And presumably all these things, all this great balancing act that's going on is part of that stabilization process? Yes, it is. It's exactly that. It's, it's getting the machine comfortable with the flow that it's experiencing, in particular, the, uh, the compressor, compressor, because it's a reciprocating machine. So, you know, it's, it's shaking and moving around and, and trying to uh, balance flow in, flow out. Uh, that's going very well. As I say, the number of uh, shutdown experiences grows fewer, and our speed of getting the the the, the plant back online is now down to sort of half an hour. Uh, once we've we fixed whatever's to be fixed, so it's it's getting to be a much smoother operation. And if you know, I, I want to look back here. If everything goes to plan, which is an earlier question, we get to ten million standard cubic feet. That's about three million therms uh, at current prices. Uh, that's uh, about 12 million pounds of, of, of revenue. Now, um, admittedly, about, uh, I think over, on an average over the three years, somewhere over half is, is hedged, but it gives you an idea of the cash flow uh, potential of this, uh, of this field. It's, it's really staggering. That's a monthly uh, figure. Two so, thoughts. Um, is that a gross figure? Is the 12 yeah, million? And that's a turnover. That's a set top line sales figure. So if you've got uh, 3 million uh, firms. Uh, a, 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 a month, uh, and you've got about four quid a firm, then obviously you've got 12 million headline revenue. But I remember half of that is hedged, so let's ignore a little over half um, in, a, in a varying um, of a varying quantity. So all I'm trying to give you is a picture of the cash flow potential of the field uh, if, if things go to plan. How, how much of that currently... Uh, of that 12 million would come to you and how much would come to the other party and at what point do you actually uh, purchase the the other half of the the other half of salt Philippe? or has well, that already we, taken place that, that's really effectively hands we own 100 percent of it but we've got a, re, uh, a residual obligation to pay um 
uh, their share, the share they would have had, their 49% share, until such time as they reach a threshold, which I think from memory was about six or seven million, um, uh, 6.5 million. So they'll continue to take their cut, but only when we are getting our cut. Uh, and so that will be relatively quickly, as you can, you can imagine, if we're successful in, uh, in getting the sidetrack on and the second compressor in, uh, and we're flowing away. So it would be a very quick pay down of debt and a very quick pay down of this sort of deferred uh, consideration to, uh, to uh, forum energy. Yeah. Fantastic. That's a, a, a very good answer, George. Uh, I'm also keen to ask about progress with the sidetrack. You mentioned the sidetrack uh, in several different answers there. Um, we've heard so much about it. It's really a big deal at Salt Fleet B. What's the position there? And as Dave Ruth and Jonathan Smith ask, when will it come online? And when's the latest date you think you'll know if it's been as successful as you hope it, it, it will be? Right. OK. So... Yeah, assuming we 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 satisfy ourselves of stabilized production uh, later this month, we would uh, we would begin uh, the process of mobilization and start organizing for uh, um, uh, for contractors to actually arrive at site. So that would be in three to four weeks time after after we made that call, which we haven't yet made because I want to be absolutely certain this is a plant where we're entirely comfortable with. Uh, before introducing another layer of complexity. Uh, so uh, in a good world, somewhere around the middle of October would be an ideal time for mobilization. Uh, then you've got maybe- Mobil four By mobilization, you mean? People coming onto site, um, equipment coming on, rigs going up, uh, and a spud date a few days later. So and how, how long uh, post spud uh, before it either works or doesn't work? About- 40 days, it would be reasonably obvious whether or not we were getting uh, the flow we're getting. We wouldn't be able to measure it until the end of that 45 day period. Okay. But I think we'd have a we'd have a fairly good idea um, before then. Fantastic. OK, that sounds that sounds great. Well, uh, best of luck for the mobilization. Yeah. OK. Have you, have... Um, okay, uh, you bought the other half of Salt Fleet Fle 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 from your sleeping partner. Sorry, I'm just catching up with my own questions here. Uh, how much did that cost, and, and does it still look like good business? Well, I, I look at it like this. Again, I say what you're sitting on here is is a gold mine. Gas prices may not sit around at at seven or four pound a sum for very long, but they're not going back to fifty pence a sum. Not not in the next five or probably ten years. What you're looking at, I've just said, is, is a, a low estimate of the, the structural gas price of north of 150 pence a sum, maybe 200 pence a sum. Now, we've got in this field, uh, we have, um, I think it's 180 million therms of, of um, P90 reserves. That's the sort of 90% probability they'll be recovered. Uh, and we've got 120 million of, uh, I think it's C1 contingent uh, uh, resources, which which we also have a high hope of recovering. So you've got you've got somewhere in there at at two pound a therm, um, somewhere between three hundred and sixty and um, uh, uh, so, so, uh, eight hundred million. You know, so, so a huge sum. You've got you've got you're sitting on half a billion uh, quid's worth of gas uh, at the current. Well, actually, at the current forward price, very very much more. Um, the current form, form. But there is absolutely no guarantee. Let's make this clear for investors that the current yeah. price will be the price in a year's time or two years' time or exactly or hence. Exactly. It could drop, it could drop precipitously. But I think you asked me why we think it's a good value acquisition, is that we take the view that that gas price is likely to remain high for quite a long time. And there's a lot of reasons why. There's a lack of uh, there's been a historic lack of investment for the last five years. It takes you know, three or four years to bring one of these things online. They don't, they don't, um, don't imagine that they'd come on quickly. And even now, I think uh, some of our brothers in, in, in gas have difficulty raising money, unbelievable as it may sound to you, uh, because of institutional policy about hydrocarbons and so on. It's, it's not easy out there, still not easy. So uh, we see a very strong gas price for, for, for many years to come. Um, and uh, on, on that basis, Having between 180 and 300 million therms, you know, sitting on them, this 
This is a very, very, very valuable asset. Uh, so we acquired that uh, their share for, I think it was 20% of, the, of Angus uh, and, and six million pounds. And, uh, uh, you know, that's not a bad deal. Um, that's not a bad deal. <laughs> no, I think that's why it wasn't a trick question. I really, <laughs> I'm just not allowed to say. I think uh, a lot. I, I must ask questions which are actually questions. Yeah. So I think a lot of people had trouble getting their head around it at the time. But if you any, back, any reason why they sold? Why do you think they sold? Who, who sold? Oh, they, they sold. The seller. Um, they were they were a passive partner. They they were there for um, uh, for for cash payout. Uh, and they saw ahead of them the potential for cash calls to meet liabilities, uh, and they didn't want the complexity of being involved deeply in, in, in operational matters. So they were quite happy just to take money and run. And after all, they, they, they've hung on to a lot of upside here, had a 20% stake that they acquired at about whatever, 1.2 pence, uh, uh, and here they are you know, with a price around 2 pence. So. They've got some of their upside, and I think they're hanging around for, for more. So okay. they're not unhappy. Fantastic. It's lovely to hear of people who are not unhappy. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us in broad terms when you hope Angus might be debt-free. You alluded to debt-free. You said you're able to pay the debt down pretty quickly because your cash flows are strong now. Uh, and that, So that, let's take that as a standalone question. When do you think you might be debt-free? Uh, if price prices hold-ish, I mean, even felt... 200 pence a thumb, and we're successful with the sidetrack. Uh, and our second presser is running this year, and I would expect hope both to be running this year. Then that debt will disappear in a little under three months, uh, four months, something like that, really, really quickly. So, a bit the other side of Christmas and beyond, this February, maybe? No, uh, assuming we get those two um, uh, not far off. The end of Q1. We'd like to think it will it will vanish very quickly. Okay. Um, the, the cash flow. Q1 2023. Q1 2023. Don't. I said that there's a caveat with we get that side track done, we get the compressor in place, then it's a machine. It's just a cash machine. And yeah. Just, well, there we go. Two 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 milestones uh, uh, to look forward to, and no doubt we'll get some news flow from you. Uh, while we're going through that process. That's all good. Uh, my second part of that, the same question, is being over profitable a tricky thing currently, given the political climate and the fact that windfall taxes are being debated? Windfall taxes are actually being introduced in the EU, but uh, Liz Truss, it would appear, is not going down that route, but may with public pressure. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I, th I think it's, um, it's, it's, I don't think it's an unfair thing uh, myself to consider windfall taxes uh, if, if it's structured properly. And I thought, I thought at first the government had done a very good job here. They, they were offering basically 91p in the pound back if you went out there and you drilled. So every, every pound you, you drilled, you got 91p back from the government. So you never, if you were you know, out there to go and help, you'd never pay any of this tax or barely any. Um, the issue is that there's a sunset clause on the bill uh, and on when you can claim that relief uh, and that some tech course is like three years away. And you and I know, as we've struggled ourselves, particularly if you're in the onshore, to get a planning permission, uh, uh, an environment agency permit, to, to wade through um, all the other regulatory uh, uh, morass of, of modern uh, uh, production, particularly in gas, fun enough. Uh, what's the chances of getting all of that done, getting the money raised, getting the field drilled, in, in that three years, you know, I'd love to go out there and help government. But if you've got a cutoff period uh, when relief can't be claimed or even be, be drawn backward in time, then you've kind of said to us, uh, um, you know, what's the point? So I, I've got an issue with the way the bill's structured. And I do hope Liz Trust goes and, uh, and the act is structured now and, and, and takes it apart. From our perspective, we've got an awful lot of um, capex this year, which, which, which should insulate us for a while whilst... Uh, the government sorts it out. But I do think, yes, it, it's not been done as well as it could have been done. So quasi Quarteng uh, indeed needs to pay heed. Well, I hope they do, yes. Uh, and I know, uh, I know a number of people did try 
to speak to government about this. There was a seven day consultation period, Donald. You know, you don't, they didn't give a lot of time on this one. And I feel, I think they, they did feel pressured by the public. But the public should, should understand if we don't get out there and drill, these prices get worse. Uh, and it's, 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 it's the fact that people have not been drilling for the last five years, that the environmental lobby has been too successful, uh, that we're caught in this quandary and now people are turning on coal all over the world. So Yes, which is uh, completely bonkers because the transition fuel is, is gas, obviously. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, Okay, uh, I, I have to say that's enough from me. So I've been using other people's questions and interjecting with my own, but from now on, it'll pretty much be, be investors. So PHEAT investors, it's your moment in the sun. Uh, David cleverly asks, are you concerned by Angus Energy's price volatility? I mean, share price volatility, volatility means. And what would you say to reassure nervous investors? And likewise, Kevin Pugh says, can you explain the drastic selling and weakness in the share price over the past week? Uh, yeah, yes, both. Uh, and one of the reasons I, I deferred going straight out with interviews is I was conscious that there were a lot of warrants uh, which were potentially exercisable uh, after we announced First Gas. And we knew there was going to be a considerable uplift. Uh, we, we've seen those warrants being absorbed uh, by the market uh, over, la over the end of last week. And there was the predictable pullback in the price. The underlying story is a long term story. I keep saying this. We're going to have some great short-term cash flow. But in the long run, if you want to see the real value of the shareholding, you've got to look at the full reserves and resources of this company and look at the forward gas price. And it's a very simple equation to do. Everyone can do it themselves. In the short run, yes, we had to absorb a lot of warrant issuance last year. Uh, and those are guys, well, you know, fair dinkum. They supported us when we were down on our knees and now they're, they're, they're collecting a little bit. But I hope, I hope the bulk of that's gone. Uh, from uh, so you, the, the advice is uh, to to shareholders is don't take early profits. You, I'm afraid, uh, take go, go medium term, and it's it's you've got a fantastic asset. Yeah, you, you you're sitting on a, on a gold mine. Great, good answer. Mm. On a similar theme, Paul Howe asks: Are we now in a position where whereby we can fund projects using income, so avoiding further dilution? The exercising of warrants showed on Wednesday that dilution is not the friend of the share price. So there you go. The, 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 the investors have been noting that the, the, the warrants coming into the market. But uh, yes, yes, yes and no. Yes, you can fund some projects uh, out of um, cash flow here. Um, the sorts of projects I think I'd, I'd like to think that shareholders want us to acquire may require us to be a bit bolder. I don't believe, I don't agree with um, this particular investor, that dilution is always the enemy of the shareholder. You know, it's the price, the price we watch, uh, and the price has done well despite dilution over the last year or two. That's um, that's what we fought in the last eighteen months. That's what we fought to get up. Um, so, uh, not always a bad thing, dilution, but yes, the cash flow should be tremendous over next year. And will it allow us to get out there and acquire assets? Yes, it should do, but. Where really where, where we should be thinking is to increase the size of Angus uh, well beyond the 100 million pound mark. Uh, so we've got to be, I think, a little bit bolder. Uh, and that may, may mean issuance in the future. But, it's very uh, interesting. Investors never want to hear about dilution, but it's yeah. a necessary part of growing each and every business. Yeah. And, and it, we're at a particularly interesting moment in our history because we, we jump a little bit further up the scale. We upscale in... We size up a little bit further, we, we start to get proper institutional funds uh, and a greater amount of liquidity uh, and volume traded, which is great for uh, uh, investors. And they, they, they have to see that, that uh, being right there at the bottom of the aim as, as we were at 10 million pounds a day, that's where you get real volatility. That's where, you know, 100 shares get traded and you move 15, 20 percent. Um, where we want to be, is a sizable company with a diversified asset base. So I'm not ever going to rule out dilution. It's not on the cards right now. And yes, you can fund an awful lot through the sheer cash generated from this. But, but let's not be silly about it. We, we want to grow the company. If you want to become a medium-sized business, then, it, then that's how it may have to be done. Okay. Uh, we received several questions on the hedging position. So I thought it'd be useful just to ask you a broad question. Uh, uh, first of all, let me ask you, how does the hedge operate? How does the Angus hedge operate? Uh, uh, broadly, I'm not going to get into the detail of the hedging because 
uh, one, one, once you do, everyone's worrying every month or saying, oh, or trying to calculate things, which are actually really quite uh, complicated. But they've also got, and we've had this experience, and you've seen this in our RNSs, there's also a lot of play uh, potential in, in, in a hedge in terms of rolling bits or, or, or rearranging little bits of it. Broadly speaking, uh, we hedged uh, uh, about, you know, I think we've uh, announced this, a uh, little over half of production for the next three years. We can juggle about those months a little bit. The hedge is simple. We have to deliver um, gas to them and they pay us a price uh, for that gas delivered uh, at roughly the same time that Shell pay us um, uh, that, that price, uh, th th their, their funds. So, um, is, is a hedge a good or a bad thing, do you think? Uh, it, it's nothing. Uh, uh, I think it's obviously not been a good thing for Angus in this circumstance. Uh, and it's an extraordinary one where there all the bankers were worrying and saying, oh, you ought to hedge half your production because it could go down to 20p. And in fact, if you remember, it did a couple of years ago. But it's worse than you ought to. They, they won't give you your funding unless you actually hedge. Isn't that how it works? That, that's exactly right. And, so you don't, um, and I don't have any option. It's really yeah. not very much to do with you. It's just how it is. It, is, it isn't. It isn't. But they're, 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 they're curiously in the reverse position now, whereby because the hedge is so far out of the money, uh, their risk is probably even greater uh, on Angus. But it's a very odd circumstance here to have hedged before such an extraordinary change in, in the long-term pricing run. All I'd remind people of is, is it is a little over half of the next three years. The other half is ours. Um, and so is the rest of the field and all the contingent reserves and resources. And this was the price for getting the thing online and getting it flowing. Well, then we paid the price. Okay. Uh, Justin Randall asks, uh, can you give clarity over the proportion of hedge that has been rolled over to Q1, Q2, Q2 2023? And are you confident production can outstrip those hedges? Um, uh, uh, I, I'm not going to go into the detail of what's been rolled and into which months. No, no one does in, in the industry. Okay. Um, Abdul Hussain Al Hakim. And he, um, Abdul Hussain Al, Al Hakim is even more to the point. He says, "Is the existence of the hedge a threat to the, to the very existence of Angus?" Which is no. slightly melodramatic. Well, uh, no, except in so far as if we fail to produce at all. Uh, Hakim, then we uh, then obviously, um, um, uh, obviously we we would have um, an extraordinarily large liability, but we are producing. Here we are; uh, it, it's in front of you. So um, no, I don't believe uh, I don't believe that to be the case. Okay, we've alluded to this uh, already in the interview. Uh, the government have brought back fracking, but haven't yet published any detailed legislation as to how it might be implemented. And as ever, the, de the devil will be in the detail. So what's your ideological position on fracking, George? Let's just ask uh, at the outset. Are you I, pro or pro or anti? I'm neutral because, um, but uh, we don't do it for a lot of reasons. One is people don't like it. And it's hard enough getting a permit to do anything in the UK. In the UK, that. people don't like it. People, will that, will that ever fundamentally change, though? No. So even if government passes a law saying it's great, you've still got to go to local council, deal with local, your neighbours and everything. And if they don't like it, they don't like it. It's, it's going to make it really difficult. Then you're in appeal. You're doing this for three years. Then the government's changed. And the new government doesn't like it, maybe. Uh, and you try and go into a financier and persuade them to go and give you 10, 20 million quid with that in front of you. There's, there's no way. The only way we can get something sensible on, on, on more adventurous types of drilling, like uh, hydraulic fracturing, is if both parties have some understanding and agreement that this is really the way forward for the nation. Uh, and, okay. and I don't, don't yet see everybody sit, sitting around a round table up, uh, agreeing with one another. Okay, very good. And uh, Gavin Johnson asks, is shale gas possible at Salt Fleet B? And could it be fracked? And it's not necessary. It's just a naturally conventional reservoir. And both reservoirs are, are, are very conventional. So no, it, it's, not a, it's not relevant. Great. Okay. Uh, good, straightforward answer. Uh, which takes us to your wheeled holdings. Yeah. Okay, fracking in the wheeled. And Adrian Watkins asks, when will you update the inc increased number of barrels of oil per day at Brockham? And my own question, is fracking allowed, or if fracking is allowed, rather, and you've kind of, we've been through this really, how will it affect the viability of these holdings? 
And will they, will they stay, still face local opposition? Yes, they will. So but will it affect the viability of this whole thing? Will it actually make them more valuable? No, it won't make any difference to us. It might make a difference to some of our colleagues there in the wheel. Uh, but we're, we're conventional reservoirs. Brocken will be a Portland-only reservoir again quite shortly. We'll abandon the Kimmeridge, as we said, we will. Uh, and it will be a steady, modest producer, I hope, in, in the order of 100 to 200 barrels a day, maybe maybe a little bit more. We, we've no, no clear idea. We haven't performed the, the, the work over yet. So I'm not giving it an advice there. I'm just saying that's an aspiration. Um, Lizzie, when, when will the work over take place? Uh, potentially? Uh, as soon as the uh, Environment Agency permit comes through. Um, and uh, how long is a piece of str string? But they've been very uh, helpful and engaging to date. So uh, we'll, we'll wait and see uh, if, if there is a requirement for um, a, another big application there. And then Lidsey, similarly modest amounts, and Balkan pending appeal. So they're all three very conventional reservoirs. We'd never frack them. We wouldn't even dream of trying in the south of uh, Watford Gap to frack anything. And I think anybody who does try is, frankly, got a screw loose. <laughs> <laughs> See what you think, George. <laughs> no. Fair enough. Um, back to Salt Fleet B, on to safer ground. Uh, and Martin Grant's question. Can you talk about the storage potential for gas at Salt Fleet B and the potential financial rewards for Anguis? Do you see gas storage being part of the Fleet, Salt Fleet B story? I do very much. I, and I think a potentially very valuable uh, part of the story. It's possible to keep, uh, if we accelerate production very considerably, we then got the southern lobe, which is this contingent resources I mentioned of 120 million tons, 12 BCF. We can then address that and be shifting and repurposing the whole northern part of the field to storage. Now, that's a very, very considerable storage uh, potential. Give you an idea, rough, I think, was about 3 billion cubic metres. Uh, it was the biggest by a long stretch. We'd be close to 0.9, uh, maybe 1. Uh, and then the next nearest one is like 0.2. A billion cubic meters. So let's, it's let's be clear here. We're actually talking about gas storage under the ground, utilizing uh, the old cavern. Is that right? Well, it's not a salt cavern. This one is utilizing the actual field from which we will have extracted everything we need after uh, a relatively quick period of time uh, from the northern side, uh, end of our. We have done a bit. Opportunity. And if not as a national gas strategic reserve, then quite possibly, uh, being seeing as we have quite a lot of connections here to the Humber and, and as well to the transmission network, some CO2 or even potentially hydrogen. But it, it's close. The, the point is, is that we're linked to the whole Humber complex. And um, in that complex, there's a great, great plethora of of bubbling ideas of how to deal with transition. So do, could it be valuable and useful to, to us as shareholders uh, and also to the nation in years to come? Yes, I actually certain of it. Just as sheer size. Uh, how, many, quite... how many years before you would get it into, into production as a gas storage facility? I think realistically... Um, five? Five, yes, exactly. Uh, and you're, you're, you're talking um, significant... Uh, uh, capex. So, so as, as a strategic reserve, that would clearly need to be done with official support. Uh, as a CO2 reservoir or a hydrogen reservoir, then that's something one could partner with other industry partners, I think, and, and, and explore things there. But yes, it's got, got no, it's definitely of value. How exciting. That's great to hear. Um, okay, a couple of people have asked about the long term gas price, which is driven by Putin's war in Ukraine. It's very, very volatile currently. How many, many years may that volatility uh, continue for? Oh, I, I, don't see, I don't see people um, taking Russian gas back in a great hurry um, very quickly. Um, so uh, I, I, I think we won't necessarily see a lot of volatility, but I think we'll see high forward prices uh, for a long period of time. Uh, and, I, and, and as I mentioned earlier, it's the absence of new fields being brought online it's the fact that for the last five years, people have not spent on exploration. Um, and in particular, the majors who lead the industry uh, have been so um, uh, uh, pushed back by the environmental lobby. Uh, that, you know, they, they pulled out of so many projects 
that it's very difficult even for the mid tiers to follow in in when when they've when they've left the the room so to speak so it's 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 a difficult one uh, and as i said even now it, you go for institutional funding debt or equity it, it's difficult institutions are tied up with policy policy decisions on hydrocarbons they've now got to review it, it will take a lot of time before we're really investing again as a nation we're really opening up new gas fields um so I, I, I see it as, as high for a long period of time. Okay, that's slightly depressing uh, <laughs> from a, a, a consumer perspective, because uh, you know what you're talking about, George. Uh, staying with pricing, Wayne Lomax asks, when will you be able to monetize the gas we're selling? There's a bit of confusion over how much we're getting, thanks. Right, okay. Well, I can't give you specific figures without doing an RNS, obviously, but the broad, the broad, uh, uh, the, uh, the the normal uh, mode in in, in uh, gas houses you simply get paid at the end twenty days after the end of the month, so um, that you're not paid daily you're you're paid on a monthly. Um, but you're 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 currently in receipt of of uh, revenues on a, on a, on a 20, 20 day rolling basis then. No, twenty days after the end of the month for the month. So you, it's a bit okay. Lovely. So, but um, but but you, you have you started receiving any revenues? I suppose is that a fair question? Uh, that's a fair question, and and yes, we 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 uh, we just sent our bank details to uh to our shippers, so we will we will within ten days, yes, start receiving. Wonderful. So it's just about to start to happen. Yeah. Well, that's very kind. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Tara Taylor asks: You noted in previous RNSs you were seeking to acquire five new sites. Can you please provide any update on these? Right. Well, we have got two new sites for geothermal. Um, th this is what we're talking about. Is it Tara? Ta I really don't know. This is all she says. Tara, yes. I, but she doesn't give any details. I, th I thought she meant geothermal, but in truth, yes. I don't know. Yes. Well, um, we are. Uh, and we have two uh, geothermal sites so far. We've also engaging in partnership discussions with um, a major local uh, uh, industry and landowner, uh, and we're planning a seismic campaign. Uh, it was slated for this winter. I'm not sure if we'll get it in before the weather turns too bad, in which case it would be early spring. That seismic campaign would be in East Devon uh, and a, quite a significant um, campaign. Uh, and, and from that uh, would, would follow detailed planning on a uh, on a drilling campaign so yes things are moving ahead there uh, we are in earnest on that we have been shockingly overworked donald trying to get this plant uh, up and running uh, but we're not forgotten on geothermal uh, work and it, it remains certainly for particularly with the the younger guys here the most exciting part of the business it is the cash cow which means you can afford everything else though exactly exactly so I wouldn't be disagreeing with you focusing on your on your uh, main on your main flagship project. Uh, Christopher Aspinall and Ian Elcock uh, say you mentioned previously that Angus hoped to be able to issue dividend payments in the future. Is this still the plan? No, are, you no, gonna, no. are you going to pay a dividend? Uh, I, I certainly want to be paying a dividend, particularly when we clear the debt. There's the moratorium, I think, on dividend payments while the debt's outstanding. When we clear the debt, I think there's no better way to thank long-term shareholders for, for their support. And it's too soon to get some sense of what that dividend payment might be? I think it is too soon. I think we wait and see. And, um, and, but but I, do, we, I think we're all committed to that. Thank you. Uh, an interesting question from three different investors. People are all asking this, this same one. So it must be a tricky one, otherwise they wouldn't be bothering. Uh, uh, Tom Mullen, Tim Owen, and Scott Perrin. If an offer comes in to sell the company, is this something you would consider? I don't think so right now. I, I think we've got uh, an unusual situation where you've got uh, shareholders who, who are beginning to believe in the story again, and we've got some new large permanent shareholders uh, with deep pockets who are keen to see the company expand. Uh, so I, I think this is the moment to be strengthening the management team. You may have seen some recent uh, a recent board appointment. Uh, we, we're able to reach out to a, a much deeper pool of talent and, and some really high quality uh, people here. The Chris Zelecki, whose announcement was, uh, was, was went out by RNS the other day, extremely senior BP man, uh, TNK, uh, and, um, uh, and uh, I hope some others in the pipeline. So we're beginning to get 
the talent that we need to um, to look at, uh, at acquisitions extremely seriously. Uh, so I, I'm, you know, I, I don't think it's the last moment. I think we'd uh, we'd go sell out. You're, you're strengthening the business, not selling the business. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Very good. Uh, this comes up in every shareholder Q and A. This time from John Wilson. Why doesn't the board have a more invested interest in their company? The board's total shareholding is very low. Uh, uh, that's very true. Um, we, we've actually uh, awarded ourselves uh, very few options as well in the last three years. Uh, none of my uh, senior team are enormously wealthy. Uh, all of them have family commitments. So people uh, people say, oh, why don't you put in 100 grand, George? And, uh, and I'd say, well, you know, I actually came to work for Angus so that they paid me something. <laughs> rather than, yes, rather than you invest in them. <laughs> but, but frankly, I, I'm also kept myself and, and the team as one of the lowest paid boards on the game. <clears throat> That's something which may or may not be appropriate as more, uh, as, as we bring more talent onto the board. But, but you know, we, uh, I, I'm not going to be asked to work for a company and pay for it. Um, so I, I'll make my investments when, when I want to make my investments, frankly. Very good. Yeah. A wonderfully spotty question from Adrian Watkins. I love this question. I've no idea what it means. Uh, what's the maximum possible flow rate from the four-inch pipeline and three times compressors can handle? Uh, what's the maximum four-inch... What's the maximum possible flow rate uh, through four-inch pipeline and three time, three compressors? But what's the maximum that that combination could handle? Oh, he's, he's asking whether or not there's a stretch of four inch pipeline between uh, a 10 inch line that we have and national grid and whether or not it could cope with substantially more capacity. Yes, the answer is yes, a lot, lot more. So, um, uh, and yes, it's rated to a very high flow rate and can cope with temperature and velocity and the like. And uh, if he wants, I'll publish a spec sheet on that, on that material. Oh, he would love that. Uh, Adrian Watkin. Okay, Adrian would love that. On a, Adrian's behalf, I'll say yes, please, to a flow sheet, please. Okay. Uh, do you find yourself becoming a little bit spotty yourself, George? Oh, <laughs> uh, I was already there. <laughs> you seem to know an awful lot about the detail. <laughs> yes, my, my, my wife gets quite... Um, Makes, uh, make fun animated. Out. Makes fun out of me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell her I said she's a bad person. <laughs> Uh, uh, two technical questions from me and Broughton, given that we're in a technical flow here. Is it possible to re perforate the other wells on site? Uh, on, at Salt Fleetby? Mm -hmm. At Salt Fleetby, uh, um, yeah. Well, effectively, what we're doing with side tracking, you no, know, would you re perforate any of them? No, the, most of them were sh shut when they were shut because they, they'd uh, exhausted that piece of the reservoir or they'd encountered water. So, in each instance, you want to go and find, uh, you want to sidetrack away from where they were at. So what you need to be doing is actually, could you, could you, uh, you let me re yeah, yeah. let me, on his behalf, we, 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 can you sidetrack the rest of them? Uh, uh, yes, yes, they're all, all sidetrackable. Um, and it, how it, much it, does your sidetrack cost? Just remind uh, us. Less, less than a newly spudded well, so two to three million, whereas a newly spudded gas well at the stacks may be four plus. To five. Um, so might so that in the future be part of a, a, a future plan? Yes. And equally, when we looked at storage, um, we looked at repurposing those wells uh, for, as injectors or even observation wells. So there's a lot you can do, but uh, reperforation isn't one that would be appropriate here because um, we, we, there's nowhere to go above where we were at. It's where you might traditionally reperforate if you had a layer above that you've not been into you, you can't really easily reperforate below uh, and these wells as i say have come to the end of their useful lives because uh, where they were in the reservoir it's no longer productive so you want to be sidetracking away moving horizontally away from where they were rather than just perforating in situ um, otherwise you're just uh, really you're not getting anywhere at all you're just uh, making a bigger hole where you weren't getting anything very good, very clear. Uh, second part of the question from Ian Broughton, and does the processing plant or the connection to Salt Philippe have flow limits that could cap production for the two wells, yet keep sidetrack producing at capacity? So could you cap your, your, two, um, your two wells, existing wells, yeah. in order to keep the sidetrack producing at capacity? Not quite, quite sure why he wants to do this, but he asks, is that you, possible? You might well want to, funny enough, uh, 
for, for body reasons uh, here, that uh, <laughs> if you wanted to balance uh, pressure between the three wells, uh, you might well cut uh, uh, B, B, B2 and A4 right back, uh, and then this um, uh, B8, uh, B7, sorry, allow that, uh, because it would have a very good virgin pressure uh, to, uh, to, to do the bulk of your production and your bulk of your, provide the bulk of the gas for the processing. So yes, there's great freedom to be choking back different wells or even shutting them in. But we prefer not to shut them in as they approach the end of their lives because you start getting issues with, with just gravity and water and so on outside the world. Okay. Like right Final now, question. Final question. You've been fantastic, George. You've put up with a, put up with a lot this afternoon. Uh, my final question from Martin Brighty. I followed the whole Langa story closely. Many congratulations to you and the team. Would you mind making a video to show investors like myself around the plant? As I think it's a massive engineering achievement. Many thanks. Super. Uh, yes, and I'd love to. Okay, yes, so we'll Martin, Martin wants a video of the whole thing because he thinks it's marvellous. <laughs> we'll have to do that, during, sadly, during a maintenance shutdown or, or get some very expensive cameras because uh, we're not allowed to bring on anything uh, onto that site anymore uh, with, with uh, any kind of battery or uh, fancy electronics unless it's rated. Uh, but we can invest in an ATEX rated video camera and do that. Very good. We've uh, sadly come to the end of a list of questions. Massive though they are, we've come to an end. I've got to say, uh, George Lucan, uh, Chief Executive Officer at, uh, at Angus Energy, you've been a complete star. Uh, thank you so much for uh, spending the time and, uh, uh, and uh, applying your spotty, spotty brain to all these, these questions and these wonderful answers which you've given us. Thank you so much. Uh, and that's it for, for us. Um, go well, everyone, and uh, have a good day.